Greetings. I am FanBot9000. I am the custodian of the Professor's Ship of Understanding. It is a marvel of science, and a little bit of magic. Here any question can be answered, and the only stupid questions are those that are never asked. Today's episode of Chloe and the Professor is something new. We call it Mailbag. A special where we take comments and questions from you the community, and our show creator answers them. Take it away Chloe. Thanks, Fanbot. With me is Mike, creator of the show. Hey Chloe, thanks for having me on the show. Our first question comes from the owner of Gamers Bay. What is your favorite Star Wars game? That would have to be Star Wars Battlefront 2. But what about the new one? Because EA's Battlefront is not Battlefront. I mean, it's it's basically, it, it's not like Battlefront 2 at all. It's missing a single player campaign. It's, in, it's missing the conquest mode that was in Battlefront 2. It basically misses the all the charm of the first two games. Completely misses it. I mean, it looks pretty, has great audio. I mean, it, I, it plays great. But there's just that something special that's missing from the game that really made the first two games really good. And that's why so many people don't like the new one. That's why they, they're, they're so angry about you know, the new game not being as good as the previous two, even though it looks great. I mean, you can polish a turd as much as you want, it's still going to smell. I mean, not that it's a horrible game, it, it just doesn't feel like a real Battlefront game. It just feels like Call of Duty with a Star Wars mod, basically. And the fact that it's missing so much content that was in the first two games, like space battles and combat in different eras of Star Wars, it just screams, we're releasing this game, you know, in its current state, and then we're going to sell you the rest of the game as DLC in order to make more money. That's common EA practice, and it's, it just ruined the game. It did. True. You aren't the only one who was disappointed by it. Moving on. Snapback Will asks what is your least favorite console, and why? He stipulates that it must be one you've actually owned. Sad to say, but I'd have to say that my least favorite console was the Xbox 360. I didn't expect that as your answer. We had the Xbox 360 and it was, really wasn't, you know, that great a machine. I mean, sure the graphics look good. But compared to the PS3, it wasn't that great. But there really weren't that many interesting games out for it. Um, but I did play Elder Scrolls Oblivion on it. And technically it was my roommate's machine. I didn't actually own it, but I was living with him at the time. And he's my roommate today. And it really, really didn't attract us to it. We didn't like the controller that much. I mean, the controller was okay. The D-pad was awful. And the selection of games was the same as what you could find on the, uh, on the PS2 and PS3. It never really grabbed our attention, never really got us interested in it. And so... You know, it wasn't really my favorite console. I've owned many. I've owned a Atari 2600. I owned an NES, a Super NES. I had a Sega Genesis and Sega CD for a short time. I also had a TurboGrafx-16 and CD-ROM drive, and that I really liked that. That was a good machine. Despite what people say about it, that was a great machine. And, but I didn't technically own the 360, but it was there available in the living room to play with for anybody in the house, and it was my least favorite. 
Well, now that you explain it, that way I can understand. Our final question of the day is from Wickirk2002, who asks, what do you think of the new Radeon RX 480? I was pretty impressed with the announcement. Yes, it was an, another awkward presentation by AMD. They really need to work on that. And all the NVIDIA fanboys in the room were quiet. But I think the RX 480 is going to be a big game changer for AMD. I think that, uh, you know, the NVIDIA fanboys out there are going to be quite surprised at the impact this card's going to have. But it is a low-end card, right? Yes, it is, but I prefer to use the term entry-level rather than low-end. Uh, you also have to understand is that this is a card that is as powerful as the previous generation's high-end. The performance, based on the specs alone, the performance places it somewhere between the GTX 970 and the 980 Ti. And, you know, that's not, that's not a, um, a weak graphics card. That's a pretty powerful graphics card for an entry-level card. And that's pretty up there. So, it is a low-end card that raises the bar for entry-level graphics. Exactly! I mean, the, the RX 480 is an entry-level card that is as powerful as last generation's high-end. It's performance-wise, based on the specs alone. Based on the specs alone, its performance should lie somewhere between the NVIDIA GTX 970 and 980 Ti. And, you know, that's pretty impressive for a entry-level card. Yes, it's previous generation performance, but that can play current games at 60 frames per second. You know, at, um, you know, 1080p. I could easily do it. But the one thing that this card was meant for, the one thing this card was meant for, and this is a $200 card, is meant to lower the barrier of entry for virtual reality, for VR. These VR headsets are expensive. I mean, you, you add on top of it the price of a six or $700 graphics card, and then you've got six $700 for an HTC Vibe, I think around 500 for an Oculus Rift, and it's expensive. It gets up to like a thousand dollars. This helps to alleviate that a little bit by making the cost just two hundred bucks. This is a. And this card uses a lot of the new, you know, it's a it's the Polaris uh, GCN architecture. The new car, new technology uses the new FinFET process. It is fourteen nanometer process. So it uses less power. It has a, to, to say, a 125 TDP. So the most that this will pull is 125 watts. So it's not going to get that hot. And it only has a six-pin power plug, not a eight-pin. Uh, so I likely won't be overclocking this. Also, one limitation of previous entry-level cards has been you could not. SLI or Crossfire them. They didn't have the, the connectors for Crossfire or, or um, SLI. This one does. In fact, you can combine two of them to get performance that is almost on par with the 1080. Almost, with two of them together. So, you know, this is a pretty um, big deal for AMD. And I don't think NVIDIA the NVIDIA fanboys out there who were sitting in the audience going really realize what AMD has done with this card. So, yeah, it's lower end. It's um, oh, uh, entry level. Yeah, it's not as powerful as AMD's high end that's coming. And we still haven't seen AMD's high. I mean, if their entry level is this powerful, what's their high end going to be? And it, 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 it's mind-blowing what they've done. NVIDIA fanboys just don't realize what AMD has done with this. 
think they're going to be massively surprised just how how, how popular this card's going to be. A $200 graphics card, as powerful as the previous generation high-end. Wow. Well, that is good news for gamers who can't afford to buy a $700 graphics card. Oh, I totally agree. That's all we have for today. If you have any questions for the show, feel free to share them via the comments below or on Twitter. You will find my Twitter handle in the description below. We'll see you next week. See you next time. Alright, back to you, fanbot. Thank you for watching our first mail episode. Until next time, near Mastay.